Prime Minister, you're visiting India as the chief guest for our Republic Day Parade on January 26th. Is this your first visit to India? No. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I had gone to Sri Lanka uh, to a conference. And um, on my way back to London, I stayed off in Delhi for about two or three days. But because um, it was the season of the monsoon, it was not possible to um, go very far from the hotel. This being your first visit to India, actually, because you were in transit, as you said in, on the last occasion, what kind of emotions does this evoke? After all, when you came here, you were the descendant of Indian indentured labor. And now you're visiting that country uh, as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, it is indeed an honor, because as you know, uh, the Indians who came from India maintained a lot of the cultural uh, heritage and a lot of the practices, cultural practices. And so therefore, uh, India is not unfamiliar in that sense, at least psychologically. Uh, but to return as prime minister must indeed be an honor. Um, what is the agenda that you're carrying with you? Um, first of all, we go there as a goodwill visit, uh, the invitation of the government of India. Uh, but secondly, and equally importantly, is the fact that we are taking a very large uh, trade mission with us. And we hope um, to establish trade, trading links with, uh, with, with India. There, has, there is already in existence a strong cultural link. And now we, we are trying to establish that trading link with, uh, with India. But isn't the distance between India and the Caribbean and Trinidad and Tobago, isn't that very forbidding? How do you surmount that huge problem? It is a disadvantage, and that is why, obviously, Trinidad and Tobago's economy has been dependent upon uh, the United States and upon Britain and upon the uh, Latin American region that surrounds it. But in this modern world of uh, tremendous technology, distance um, is not very important when one begins to deal with commerce. Uh, for example, I understand that India is interested in establishing uh, economic relations with Latin America. And Trinidad and Tobago is an island that sits seven miles off the coast of Venezuela. So that um, if we establish relationships within the economic relationships, Trinidad and Tobago can act as an entrepot to Indian investments in Latin America. Have you had preliminary conversations with Indian businessmen? Uh, yes, we have had um, several discussions with visiting Indian teams that have come over here. And um, they have indicated to us their willingness to set up business in Trinidad so that they themselves can um, access wider markets. As you know, Trinidad and Tobago is um, seeking entry into NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement that uh, uh, includes Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And um, if that, in fact, comes to fruition, then Trinidad will have access to an enormous market so that Anyone investing, any foreign invest, investing in Trinidad would also have um, access to those markets. We are also negotiating a trade agreement with um, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, the Dominican Republic, so that Trinidad is very well poised uh, geophysically and uh, geopolitically in, in the Caribbean to be an entrepot for foreign investments. Are you thinking in terms of a large warehouses? in uh, Trinidad on the mainland here, where Indian goods can be, uh, can be parked. Because otherwise, you have a two-month period by, by the time the ships reach here. Because the distance is a huge problem. The warehousing would be part of what we hope would be the investments. What we'd be hoping to do is to uh, attract investments in manufacturing so that the goods can actually be manufactured in Trinidad for export to Latin America. What kind of goods do you have in mind? Um, there, I, I think there's an opportunity for a lot of consumer goods. Um, and uh, we are also trying to attract Indian investments in the downstream petrochemical industries. We also understand that the Indian uh, business community is interested in entering into the petroleum field here. And as you know, that is dominated uh, by Americans. So that should provide the kind of competition that is healthy for our country. Mr. Prime Minister, do you have any, have you been able to track down your roots in India? Yes, um, both on my, on my maternal side. My grandmother and my grandfather uh, came from uh, Lakshmanpur in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, my great-grandmother 
And I was there, but my grandmother's mother was a Bengali. Uh, my f father, uh, side I have not been able to trace uh, yet. Why did they come over? Uh, did, did you, have you um, heard from your mother or your great-grandmother? Yes, they came over to Trinidad because they thought there were economic opportunities there. As you know, um, they came over as indented laborers uh, because the economic opportunities in India were far and few and there was much poverty and so on. And they thought by coming to Trinidad, they would enhance the economic position. You see, Pandey is a very high-caste Brahmin name uh, in, in the vicinity of Varanasi. You throw a stone in any direction and you might pick a, a Pandey. Uh, but um, the indentured laborers who came here were actually people in dire want and from the lowest stratas by and large because to cross the black waters was a sin as far as the Brahmin is concerned. How do you explain the Pandey's presence in well, Trinidad? As you know, it's a caste name. Pandey is a caste name. Uh, there are not very many Pandeys in Trinidad, but that's true. And, but there are many Maharajas. What is, how does this name come about? Um, I am not too sure. Uh, I, I am not too sure what are the origins of the, the, the name Maharaj, because it, it, from my own smattering of uh, Indian knowledge, is that a, a Maharaj was a Chhatri, a ruler. That but, was a Maharaja. The Maharaj was the person, I thought, who also looked after the puja of the house. Oh, I see. But well, probably am. Um, uh, but, uh, but I suppose there are some Brahmins by birth. And in Trinidad, there are a lot of Brahmins by boat. That is, they became Brahmins on the boat. <laughs> how, how could you explain that? Oh, well, they, 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 they assumed the name Maharaj. Uh, Why would they have done that? I suppose because it gives them a caste advantage. Was it an advantage in those days to I imagine, have that kind of a name? In I America? imagine it would have been because, um, as you know, we, the Indians brought from India uh, much of the caste practices, which no, now no longer exist, of course. But um, in those days, I imagine it would have been important to be of a high caste. What was the difference between the indentured Indian experience and the slave experience uh, with, with the colonial masters? Historically, what is the difference? The African experience has been one of slavery. Enormous amount of brutality, as you know, forced uh, slavery. Slaves are captured and brought here under inhuman conditions and forced to work upon the plantations. And uh, there's no such thing as wage and, uh, wages and that sort of thing. Um, and when slavery was abolished, uh, the British sugar planters needing a cheap source of labor tried um, Portuguese labor. It didn't work. And they tried Chinese labor. That didn't work. And then they thought of uh, Indian indented laborers. And the difference being that they were paid wages. Very small indeed, but uh, they were paid wages. Uh, they lived in barracks, not unlike the slaves. The hardships they suffered, uh, physical and, and uh, economic hardships, were quite similar. I think the only difference is that they were paid a wage. Most of the people of Indian origin here, do they? They seem to have forgotten the language, really. My grandmother and grandfather spoke Hindi. My mother spoke Hindi. Uh, my father spoke Hindi. But as third generation, I, I don't know much Hindi. It's very interesting because just across the waters in Suriname, uh, people uh, of Indian origin still speak Bhojpuri and Hindi. Whereas in Guyana and in Trinidad, they've forgotten the language. How do you explain that? I think that may be due to the fact that um, Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana were ruled by the British. And it may be because of um, what I term English chauvinism. You know, the English believe that the English language is not only the best language in the world, it is the only language in the world. And um, therefore, English was stressed here. And uh, students who studied in school um, couldn't go to university unless they knew English. So the accent was in, on learning English because we were a British colony, whereas um, the uh, people in Suriname were a Dutch colony. And uh, the Dutch are not so, so chauvinistic about language as the English are. So English became the center of learning in Trinidad and Tobago, and I believe that is the reason why um, people abandoned Hindi, so to speak. It had no economic utility value. What is the ethnic mix of this island? Uh, the last census that I could remember is that um, Indians constitute 
8% and, uh, and Africans 42.6%. So it's very close indeed. Um, of course, the, the, the rest are mixed, people of mixed uh, origin. Uh, electoral politics tends to exacerbate and it, it sort of exaggerates these divisions. Yes. Uh, has that happened in this country as well? Oh, it certainly has. As a matter of fact, for several years, um, and to some extent even today, the politics has been based on the racial divide, as indeed it is in Ghana. Um, what we have been doing, though, for several years, for the past 20 years, um, the political parties have been trying to bridge that racial gap. And uh, we are moving slowly and away from it. You know, in um, experience in Fiji in 1986-87, when the, a government came into power of which the Indian component was very heavy, and there was a coup. Uh, the Melanesians didn't accept it, and there was a coup when the government of Babangra, uh, in fact, was dethroned. Uh, can there be a similar backlash in, in Trinidad and Tobago? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's possible in Trinidad and Tobago. We have been very fortunate in that al although there has been the uh, racial suspicion and the racial antagonism, it has been subdued and below the veneer of, uh, uh, of peace and so on. Uh, unlike Guyana that erupted into racial violence, we have escaped that. And I think we have crossed the Rubicon, so to speak, and I don't think that it is possible that there's going to be racial violence in Trinidad at all. And um, also there's a very strong democratic tradition in Trinidad. Within the last 10 years, Trinidad and Tobago has changed its government three times um, and without violence. So I don't think that will ever happen in Trinidad and Tobago, of course. You will excuse me, Mr. Prime Minister, but they have, globally there happen to be two Trinidadians who are more famous than Basri Pandi. One is uh, V.S. Naipaul and the other happens to be Brian Lara. Do you know them both? Yes, yes, I, I know Naipaul. I didn't know him when I, uh, before he went away, but um, after he has returned to Trinidad on several occasions. And when I was leader of the union, he came and visited the union and um, made speeches and so on. When the, the Indian cricket team is coming here, uh, how are you, are you prepared to, um, uh, just recently the, the West Indians have in fact come back in, in Australia? Yes, we're only going through a little bad patch there, that's all. But, um, we have been champions for a long time, and I'm sure we'll remain champions for an even longer time. Uh, between Tendulkar and Lara, how would you compare uh, Tendulkar with Lara? Chalk and cheese. Um, there is no comparison. Lara is obviously the superior cricketer. Why? Because he's better. <laughs> so he's better than Tendulkar? Oh, yes, of course. In what way? He's a better batsman. He's a better all-round player. Tell me, in this area of tourism, India has such a vast hotel industry. Are you exploring possibilities that Indian uh, hotel industry and tourism in the industry comes to Tobago and use that also as a bridge to, to lure American tourists to India? Have, is that sure. on the agenda? Um, the Trinidad and, uh, and Tobago economy is such that uh, we are very prolific in gas and oil, and we have been attracting a lot of industries in that energy sector. But um, they are high-tech industries and they do not create many jobs. What we have been trying to do in order to relieve the unemployment situation is to seek to develop the, co the economy uh, along those, uh, the, those lines that um, take up a lot of labor, labor-intensive type. And tourism is one of them. Agriculture, of course, being the other, the service industry being the other. But, but tourism is one of them. And we have very favorable terms and conditions for hoteliers who, wants to, who want to build up ho hotels in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, we hope that when we go to India, we'll discuss this with them, whether we can in encourage um, an invest Indian investment in tourism here. To go back, to revert to the old theme, uh, are you going to retrace your roots, trace your roots and go to your village? Yes, um, there is a gentleman whose name is Shamshuddin, who is a historian research in Trinidad and Tobago, and he is the person who actually traced my, my mother's and my grandmother's um, family. And on, on this trip, I shall be visiting the village where my grandparents came from. And suddenly you'll have a whole host of relatives 
wanting to come and settle down in Trinidad and Tobago. I have. But their relative happens to be the Prime Minister. Yeah, I suppose. Are you, are you going to make concessions for uh, immigration uh, well, for, for the citizens of Lakshmanpur? I know there, there are already exist in Trinidad and Tobago immigration laws that applies to everybody in the world. You and uh, the, uh, the uh, chairman of your party are both trade unions. You, your background is that of a, a trade union leader. How do you reconcile the apparent contradiction in a trade union leader navigating a capitalist economy? Well, first of all, um, I don't see a difference between the two, philosophically, that is. Uh, as a trade union leader, my function and my duty was to do all I can to improve the quality of life of the people I serve, which were the members of the trade union and their families. Now that I'm prime minister, it remains my objective, that is, to improve the quality of the life of the people I serve. Only this time it happens to be the whole country. Whereas well, as a trade union leader, my vision was limited to the interests of the trade union. Now as prime minister, I must balance the various interests in the country. But the objective remains the same, that is the improvement in the quality of life of the people I serve, which are the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Would you say that what has happened in, uh, you see, this cultural and ethnic mix, I think one of the great successes of, your, of, of this country is the, the harmony with which so many strands have actually have got together. Would you say that uh, this is an example of coexistence or amalgamation? Um, it is a most beautiful example of people living together. I think there are elements of both. Uh, we certainly coexist in a way that uh, very few people in the world coexist. As I say, we have elections uh, without so much as a stone-throwing incident, although the elections have traditionally had racial inter undercurrents and so on. Um, also, there's been a lot of intermarriage in, in our society. That is why I think the fastest growing group in the society are the peoples of mixed descent. So, so, so are there elements of both, I think. In other words, the Indian, the people of Indian origin are giving up their isolationism and they are sort of coming out to sense. Certainly. So it's both integration and accommodation, I think. Is, uh, are there still sort of arranged marriages and so Um Yes, only the boy and the girl arrange it for themselves. <laughs> no, there are no arranged marriages in Trinidad that I, I, I can remember. Well, there used to be in Trinidad a long time ago arranged marriages, but um, that hardly exists at the moment. Uh, was yours an arranged marriage? No, it was not. How, you met her at the, um, uh, during the carnival? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not during the carnival, but uh, my marriage was not arranged. Uh, neither of them. <laughs> now, what is the origin of the Trinidadian Carnival? The origin of Trinidad Carnival has influences both of the African culture and um, of, of the Christian culture. Uh, for example, we have something called the Kambule, and the Kambule is really the burning of canes. And the burning of canes had to do with the, the economy, the crop time, and so on and so forth, which, which um, the slaves were brought down here to, to cultivate. So there is this African input into carnival, and there's also the Christian input, of course. Uh, the, the carnival takes place 40 days before the Lenten season begins. Uh, be, the Lenten, Lenten season begins the day after carnival, and goes for 40 days and ends with Easter. So there is that Christian uh, uh, dimension what, to carnival. What has been the Indian contribution to this very lively music of this region? Uh, there has been a tremendous fusion of um, culture and music in Trinidad and Tobago, and there's been influences on both sides. For example, Calypso, which is viewed uh, as an expression of African um, culture, has been very much influenced by Indian music and Indian musical instruments. And there are many uh, Calypsonians who actually um, sing to the beat of a tasa, which is an Indian instrument. And on the other side, the uh, the Indian musical form has been influenced by the, the Calypso, so that um, there has emerged uh, an indigenous, a unique uh, cultural form and cultural expression, which we call Soka in Trinidad, which is really a mixture of both cultures, and uh, the cultures of Spanish. And uh, as you know, we have had um, influences of Spanish, French, American, the lot we've had them here. Chutney music? 
chutney. No, what, 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 is the, what is this chutney music that I hear Chutney about? music is a, a, a local uh, form of musical expression started by, by the, the Indian community. In, uh, it's folklorish in, in, in origin. Uh, the language is Bhojpuri, as you know. Uh, and that itself now is being influenced by Calypso. The, the, you mean the, uh, Chutney, the Chutney is being influenced by Calypso? By, by, by the Calypso. Indian film surely has, must have had some influence on that. Oh, yes. Cinema. Oh, yes, certainly. As you know, the, the, most of the films that come from India are films that are produced for export, and therefore they contain all the Western musical forms and dances and so on, and that has influenced them. Um, uh, Indian culture in Trinidad. Is your foreign minister accompanying you? Yes, he is. Because your foreign minister is a is a is an actor, and maybe yes. you will lose him to the film industry in Bombay. Um, I don't think so. I I, I think he loves politics more. <laughs> more than acting? Yes, I, yes, yes. You know something? Because he gets an opportunity for both. He acts while he's in politics. <laughs> <laughs> the. The, the diaspora, Indian diaspora, seems to be coming into its own. Uh, there is um, uh, Mr. Ram Gulam is the Prime Minister of Mauritius. Uh, Bas Pandey is the Prime Minister of Trinidad Tobago. There was Chedi Jagan in Guyana. Uh, in Mal Mandela's cabinet in South Africa, there are about nine people of Indian origin and uh, in Fiji and so on. Do you, do you get the feeling that over the past decades, Mother India had neglected the, the, the people of Indian origin abroad and is now turning to them. I am not sure that um, this has anything to do with the action of Mother India at all. Um, I think the experience has been, uh, for Trinidad at least, and I'm sure it applies to the other countries, is that when the Indians came here, they did not come to settle here. They came on contract to improve their economic life and go back. So that India had always been home for them, the first generation, and even up to the second generation. Uh, they thought, they always spoke of going back home to die. Uh, but I think as the third generation of Indian came into being, India receded further and further into the background. And as India receded further and further into the background, the Indian community became more and more integrated and part of the political process. And what we are seeing today is the fruit of that integration into the political process. I, th I think that is what is happening. If God gave you a choice and said, look, Bhaskar Pandey, uh, in your, 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 take your pick in your next life, you would be born in India or you would be born in Port of Spain. Where, what is your preference? I'd like to be born in India and to migrate to Port of Spain. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I've taken a great deal of your time.